way that the, the collectors can can bring that in as well because you see you know you have outfits even for me personally like you have outfits that you remember from a particular event from a particular um competitive event or a particular game that really is memorable for you bringing that into the irl world with a little card or yep. something that you know maybe maybe something bigger is i, I think it's really cool and you know we we're talking about the, the outfits earlier I, I remember i qualified for this is mini mining I have big yeah. expectations of people like Janice and Reason. Even, can I remind you, because speaking about these sort of storm surge strategies, we often see that they know exactly what happens when it comes to one of the best broadcasters for one of the most competitive games for them. Peak right now, just hold on and focus on the storm. That's not all he is, though. He's a natural content creator with his own YouTube community that he's been building for over eight years. And there it is. We've hit 100K. No way! We have done it! How did he go from this? Hello guys, Miniman here. Today I'm going to be doing a little bit of a tutorial on how to make a tree so farm. This. I'm your host, Monster D Face, casting alongside for the first time. By the way, the mini miner. What's up, brother? That's right, most of my first time on the mine. After a great run with his organization, TNA, he took an opportunity that would change his career forever. That's right. I'm going to be joining the analyst desk on the main broadcast for this season's FNCS Chapter 3 Season 2. I couldn't be more excited for this opportunity, and I thank every single one of you for all of your support. I think it's safe to say he's finally hit his stride. That was something that I was really surprised at as well, that island contestation. Yeah. So many more teams went up for it, it seemed like, but no one wanted to go all the way and try and claim it. It was Hen and Vasquez who ended up saying, you know what, this is ours, it doesn't matter about anyone else. So in today's interview, we'll talk about his story and bring him into the world of Fortnite cards. Now introducing Mini Miner. Let's go all the way back. How did you get into gaming? I seen that you were gaming for a very long time. It's, I mean, obviously it's probably over a decade, but I believe you've yeah. been on YouTube for like close to eight years. Uh, so how did you get into gaming? And then you can go into how you stumbled across Fortnite and what made you finally click that button to play. Yeah, I mean, it's if we're going all the way back, uh, I I was I've been a gamer my whole life already. Uh, yeah. I think I think my earliest memory of gaming was was I I, I never really I can never really pinpoint it because I get asked it so often, but I just can't think about the exact moment. Mm -hmm. uh, it was either playing Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube, oh, um, which was just an absolute classic game. Uh, I'm not that old, so I, I wasn't like in the in the N64 yeah. or that sort of era. But um, I think one of the earliest memories I had was was uh, Star Wars Battlefront on the PS2 as well. That was that was something so I, that would have been around 2008 2009 um but no i've definitely been a gamer since i was probably five or six uh which is uh, quite a long time ago but yeah that, that that definitely sparked my interest in gaming i think uh people in my family are gamers as well so it was sort of a natural um transition but i, I think i never really saw it as anything more than just having fun you know mm -hmm. just having fun with friends coming home from school hopping on i used to play sort of uh fifa i used to play rocket league games like that with with, with friends and gta and just different games so for me, where it all started to become quite real was when I started my YouTube channel. Mm. So I basically got inspired by a lot of different people and got inspired by just making stuff. I've always been a, a sort of creator in, in a sense. So even back when I was, before I made my YouTube channel, when I was about mm. 10 or so, I used to do little radio shows and stuff on my on my own. I didn't get sent anywhere because yeah. I think if anyone heard that, it would be quite a disaster. Um, it was the, probably the worst radio show in, in history, but it, it was just stuff. I was making right. stuff, you know, so and that sort of, that love for creating stuff and that love for producing came together with gaming when I started my YouTube channel. And yeah, just started making little sort of Minecraft videos, uh, random content that again, nobody watched <laughs> really back in the day. I think that's how everyone starts, you know, you sort of start with, with just zero views and yep. just keeping on uploading videos. Um, in my first year when I was, so I, I started my channel in 2014. In my first year I had uh, 100 videos uploaded and I gained 100 subscribers <laughs> in that time. So, yeah, you know, nowadays yeah. it's like nothing, but yeah, just that, that for me was what, what really started my whole journey, if you like. So that, that's, that's crazy. Cause it's those little moments that you kind of don't forget. But, uh, I was watching when you first started, uh, streaming Fortnite and, oh, uh, yeah. your first video and it, it seems like everybody's moment was very similar where it's just this foreign, it's this foreign game in the aspect of. You just don't know what to expect. Everybody's seen a battle royale before, but this, yep. the animations, everything was just unique about Fortnite. So how did you get, who made you click the button? Was it just something you stumbled across? How did you get into Fortnite? 
uh for me it's it's quite a cool story because i um i was a gamer as i mentioned you know, i just played a lot of games with my friends after school came home played whatever gta fifa all that sort of stuff and it was one of my friends at school this was sort of early 2018 maybe late mm. 2017 when fortnite just sort of yeah. you know it's just released and everyone's talking about it it was one of my friends and i still you know i still see him at, you know a lot of uh most months i guess you could say nowadays we're not we're not uh he's he's quite busy as well but uh still really good friends with him anyway and he basically said to me he said one day oh you gotta try this new game you gotta try fortnite it's so good i had a little look at it and i was like ah, i'm not really interested I, I, I like fifa i like rocket league i like yep. just Cause three i like the games that i like and i wasn't really interested but then he kind of convinced me at school one day he was like yeah let's let, let's play it tonight let's go home let's play it and yeah it was just you know early 2018 january i think it was literally the first of jan or second of jan yeah. um came home uh or maybe we were on one on winter break or something and yeah, just started playing it. We were absolutely terrible. <laughs> it was probably the worst gameplay anyone's ever seen. We sat in bushes and we were wearing our default skins. And uh, yeah, but he he literally got me into it. And from that point on, I was like, yeah, I'm going to play this a bit more. Yeah. And it obviously snowballed and snowballed. And now it's a, an avalanche worth of, worth of uh, interest oh in the game, which is crazy. Yeah, so that's that's pretty interesting because, you know, thinking about where you are now and how you're broadcasting the most major events for... And, I'm, I'm biased. I love Fortnite competitive. So I think it's the best comp when it comes to, you know, esports in general. Obviously, yeah. the fan base was fan bases would debate that. But um, where you are now, I mean, it's it's so interesting to hear. How did you get that call to be a broadcaster? Did you, you know? Did you interview for it? How did that happen? Yeah, so I think for me, I've I've always been interested in TV presenting. I, I sort of came from more of a TV mm -hmm. background, so um, I was very interested in a little show in the UK called Top Gear, which has you know gone gone very very big, um, or at least in that time. So that sort of got me into the TV world. I wanted to pursue actually behind the scenes in TV as mm -hmm. like my job when I was younger. So I, I would try to go on that path. Went to uni, went to university, did a degree in TV production. Okay. So I specialized in producing for studio shows. So that was obviously behind the camera stuff, very much production based, nothing on camera. Um, until some of the other groups in our university, they had some opportunities to be on camera because they needed presenters. It was very yeah. low budget. You know, they just thought oh, I would just get anyone in front of camera. So they asked me more often than not because I was one of the only people in the in the whole uh, year that could actually do it. So yeah. they're like, yeah, get in front of camera. Why not? We'll do some teleprompter stuff <laughs> and you'll you'll see how you do. And I actually really, really enjoyed doing it. I, I, I knew I wanted to do it, but I never had that belief in myself to right. actually do it. So it was it was more of a confirmation for me that was like, hey, you know what, you can actually be in front of camera, you can do quite good. And I think it was my first show. I remember I, I came off the, the, the show it was another group show. And the the tutor, the lecturer there said, that was one of the best uh, presenting wow. jobs I've ever seen anyone do in my entire time being at this uni. So I was like, that, you know, that's cool. That's a cool right. thing to hear. So yeah, that definitely just solidified the fact that I, I knew I could sort of present. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the Fortnite broadcast, that came a little bit later on. So you mentioned TNA earlier. That is a big part of the of the story where I was on the org for a long time. I built up a um, a good following on, on YouTube. I had over 100,000 subscribers. I was quite, a, I was more of a content creator mm -hmm. more than anything. So uh, that opportunity came through TNA. So I was ah, signed okay. to TNA as a content creator. They hosted a tournament ah. and it was a $16,000 tournament and they reached out to me and they said so we're hosting this big tournament we've got a production team doing it and uh it's monster d face who's casting yeah. it and he's looking wow. for someone else to cast with and of course i was you know a massive fan of fortnite competitive watched all the shows so for me yep. to receive that message from from kirsch who was the owner it was like yes i will yeah. do it <laughs> no matter what i will be doing it because uh i yeah i obviously love monster and obviously very lucky to, to work with him and to get to work with him for that first time is really really cool yeah. so yeah basically just 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 got a lot of, a lot of opportunities in the third party space from then on in Pro monster owns a production company called practice mm -hmm. server so he was able to literally give me the booster into yeah. getting into esports yeah. versus just traditional tv like i'd done before and then yeah just literally just building up reps trying to prepare for every single show as much as possible making sure that i can do as good of a job as i can and improve on the last show so i can keep yeah. developing keep improving and yeah, by the, at, at the end, basically they, the FNCS or Blast were looking for someone as, for an analyst for EU because they were just making the transition into in-studio. Mm -hmm. It was all online because obviously COVID and stuff yep. like that. 
So they needed someone to, to come in as an analyst that could do in-studio shows. And whether they whether they knew that I could do it because I had a degree <laughs> in TV production, I'd done it in-studio before, how much of an impact that had, I don't know. But it definitely had an impact on my performance mm-hmm. and my sort of nerves or lack of nerves going into that because it was just something I'd done before, but on wow. a much bigger scale. The, the way you explain things, the way you have to explain things, is it's a whole new world. You know, it's a whole new world. It's not is not common. So how did you get comfortable with the call outs that you had to do the th- the things that you noticed in the game? Like, were you, were you automatically comfortable from that, from watching competitive? Like, how did you, how did you train for that aspect? You know, just the flow of the game, you know, end game is so hectic. It's so hectic. It's yeah. so much going on. And obviously you do a lot of interviews as well, but how did you get comfortable with that part? Uh, for me, I think it was about playing the game. I uh-huh. basically played the game and I still do yeah. almost every single tournament that I can, uh, to a decently high level. I'm not, you know, a pro player, but pretty good, you know, pretty good. I've, I've got some earnings, yeah. got some decent placements here and there, right? Nothing too crazy, but because I'd been in that position before and been in that position for a long time before I got on the broadcast, mm-hmm. I sort of understood the shift in metas. I understood how the game works, mm-hmm. understood, uh, you know, the, the team modes and, and, and the FNCS as a whole way before I'd actually got on the show. So just being involved in that community and i try and bring that in my analysis i try and bring a a sense of what it's like for someone that isn't necessarily a pro player but is someone that has been in those positions before Mm -hmm. from a more casual standpoint so i try and bring every single audience in because as you mentioned it's really really difficult to to explain things in that way because fortnite isn't just watched by a particular age demographic or particular demographic at all as much as a lot of people would like to believe Mm -hmm. um it's watched by so many different people from all different backgrounds and all different understandings so that for me was the that was that was the most difficult thing for me is to make sure that I could incorporate everyone into that conversation because it's one thing knowing it yourself and knowing what you want to say, but it's also another thing actually yeah. saying it and yeah. saying it in the way that people understand, right? Yeah. No, that that's for sure. I mean, I just I just think about uh I like I said, I love I love competitive, but I couldn't imagine yeah. broadcasting it live at that moment. Just like you said, it's what you want to say and what comes out is completely two different things. And just having that skill set is definitely second to none. With that being said, I believe your first land event was FNCS Invitationals, like major yeah. event, right? Okay. Yeah. So what was, the, I went to the Invitational last year, but nice. I didn't go to the Global Championship, obviously. Um, What was the, was it a major difference in the way it felt? Like, did the did the crowd feel more engaged? Was it, you know, because I mean, Invitational felt like, you know, we're getting it back into the groove of it compared to the World Cup in 2019. So do you feel like it was a major growth aspect in between the Invitational and Global Championship? Yeah, hundred percent. And I think even there's sort of stages in that 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 were prior to the invitational that were, were important as well. Of course, we had online broadcasts yep. for the FNCS, which were great, you know, and they yep. they brought the community together during difficult times. Then we made the big step into going in studio, and I was lucky enough to be in that moment mm-hmm. and feel the vibe from the whole talent crew and feel the vibe online. It just felt fresh, it felt yeah. new, and it was like we're finally back into in studio because I don't think we've done a studio show since since the World Cup. Mm-hmm. I mean, I say we, I wasn't involved back yeah. then, but they uh, hadn't done that for for a very long time. So that vibe was then reignited again with the invitational we're actually in person we've got a massive stage a massive amount of uh, players 50 teams of course playing in that and a lo- amazing crowd a huge crowd um and then again just somehow the global championships was again another step up <laughs> yeah. where we had a, an even bigger arena even more fans even more players even more excitement even more on the line four times the prize pool mm-hmm. like it just seems to be going up a notch every single time and i think being a part of that is really really cool because yeah. you just know that there's a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of you know pressure just that I put on myself mentally, just to make sure that I'm keeping on keeping up to that that standard and keeping on being at the top um, when it comes to analysis and presenting. Because you got to do the show dust justice, yeah, right? You yeah. know, everyone else is progressing. You want to make sure that you're at the top. So it's really really cool. And I think that at Globals definitely solidified to me that you know the game's going in a really good direction. Yeah, it's going in a really good direction, and people just seem to be having fun. You know, it's like mm-hmm. they're just enjoying themselves at the event. Which is great to see because I got to speak to so many cool people, and no matter who they were, what their background was, they seem to enjoy it. So, yeah. um, from our perspective, that's what we want here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that, like you said, was that was an important thing. Um, I was, I was a little worried in the transition of, uh, you know, just everything that's happened that has happened with, uh, you know, the unfortunate layoffs. We didn't know exactly yeah. what that what that meant, and, um. I, I was I was talking on our live a couple of weeks ago. I'm like, I'm convinced after this global championship, everything's good. You know, everything's good. It's, it's just so it's it seemed as though the the best foot was put forward, you know, and I think that uh, for for the global championship, do you feel like what do you want? Do you want 
duos again? Do you want trios? Do you want solos? What do you want for the next event, whatever that may be and whenever that may happen? Uh, yeah, I think there's so much to talk about game modes. I, I, I just want to see more lands. Yeah. I want to see more of the globals. I want to see us go all over the world. Yeah. I want to see a whole new audience. I want to see different cultures getting involved because there is. I mean, we saw it at the uh, the global championships. We saw the French fans going absolutely yeah. crazy. We had a section of Polish players, uh, Polish yeah. fans up there that were supporting the Polish players. We had a Brazilian section as well. Like just seeing those communities come together is cool. So I'd like to, I think keeping FNCS Geos is, is fine. Yeah. I know a lot of people want trios. I know a lot of people yeah. You know, some people want solos. I, I'd, I'd love to see it continue in, in duos. Um, although I wouldn't be opposed to trios, I just think the storyline of duos is quite yeah, nice. You know, yeah. these guys, second at the Invitational, first at the Invitational, second at Globals. Kami Say, for example, they won the Invitational, second at Globals. What are they going to do next? Mm -hmm. But then I'd also love to see a solo uh, yeah. sort of track as well. You know, a, a solo land would be fantastic because they're always so fun to watch. Yeah. Uh, the World Cup was so crazy uh, to, to watch back in the day. Booga, of course, winning that. <laughs> that was. I was just it was just it's just cool so i i want to see more of those moments and i want to see uh more of that togetherness from the community because that for me that's what brings a lot of people together mm -hmm. is these big events because even like even some people it was in obviously in copenhagen the the royal arena some people in copenhagen just go to whatever events are on at the royal yeah. arena it doesn't matter wow, whether it's wow. Fortnite, whether it's Elton know john there okay. like it doesn't matter who's there or what's there they just go because it's a fun day out so yeah. the more people we can bring in like that the more people can expose the esport the better wow so that's that's amazing uh so in one interview, I won't misquote him, but Clicks was just talking about the skill gap when it comes to Fortnite yeah. and how Fortnite, in his opinion, is one of the hardest professional esports games. Professional Fortnite player, what do you think is the hardest video game to go pro in? Fortnite. Elaborate. Dude, it, listen, there's been so many in the in the comments being like, bro, Fortnite is the easiest Dude, Fortnite is the hardest pro to go pro in or hardest game to go pro in no matter what, dude. You need... Good aim. You need to be smart. You need to like understand while you're being smart, while having good aim. You need to have game sense of the whole entire map, surge, all of that. You need to know how to build for with fastest reaction time. You need to learn how to edit. Like, dude, Valorant, I'm not hitting on Valorant, but Valorant in like CSGO, it's like, dude, you obviously need to be really, really quick, really smart, the best aim in the game. But it's like, dude, there's no building part. There's no like rotating zones that you right. need to make sure you're ahead of. There's no dead side. There's no like, like, normal person is not gonna a normal person who doesn't play Fortnite professionally is not gonna understand what i'm saying but like dude all the pros do like there's a lot more that you need to like master in Fortnite than any other game by far do you feel that obviously you know we're major fans of Fortnite, and you know you're broadcasting consistently but do you feel the skill gap is that much greater than most games or do you feel it's more unique which one or is it a you know combination of both it's hard, isn't it? It's, it? I think for me, uh, and I feel like a lot of Fortnite pros, it, it's it's very difficult to to describe the skill gap <laughs> without being at the top of mm -hmm. both games or multiple games, right? It's like yeah. someone that I'd like to speak to about that is Benji Fishy because he is now at the top of uh, Valorant or he's competing yeah. or he's very much close to the top of Valorant. He's also got to the very, very top of Fortnite, of course. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to see what he, his thoughts are on that. But from for me, I, I think every every game has its, you know, has its difficulties when it comes to mm -hmm. mechanics or different, uh, you know, the ways that you play it. Fortnite is definitely one of those. There's, there's just so much involved that yeah. I think for people that don't understand the game as much, it can be a little bit hectic. It can be quite quite crazy to understand. But I think once you understand the fundamentals of it, mm -hmm. everything else that seems like it's a bit hectic kind of starts to make sense. Yeah. So in terms of skill gap, it's very, very difficult to get into. But I think Fortnite's done a really good job of introducing zero builds. So mm -hmm. it takes away the whole building yeah. aspect, takes away a lot of the you know storm surge and all that sort of thing. Um, and that is a nice path in. So... Yes, it is difficult. It's difficult to understand. Can be difficult to follow sometimes. But if you want to get involved and you want yeah. to listen and, and and watch, then you will get that. You will understand yeah. it. And you know, who knows? You could be a, a pro player as well, which is what's great about. One hundred percent. I mean, is the the fact that it's so early on. You, you and your team of broadcasters and everybody that has the impact of the global championship, the invitational before, y'all are probably going to be a part of a lot of people's story of who they were watching while they were preparing to become pros in five years from now, you know, and that's, I think that's what I really like about the trajectory of Fortnite and the competitive scene is that we're, we're still so early into the, into the growth and the, the storylines, like you said, of what happens uh, when those next generation of kids and gamers in general come in, the story is going to unfold in, in the same exact way. With that being said though, 
we're actually going back in time. And obviously, by the time this drops, we're already going to be in the OG season. But we're about to have a little bit of a rewind. Um, how do you feel about this transition? I, everybody's excited. Uh, do you feel the nostalgia is going to hit the same way? Do you think it's going to be a great moment for this whole month? Uh, what are you expecting from the rewind of the uh, to the OG seasons? Yeah, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. Of course, you know, like it's, it's, I think, I think it's very easy to get blinded by nostalgia and a lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's all going to be, it's all going to be a bit of a letdown. Oh, it's not going to be like it was. Um, realistically, it won't because you're not the same person you were about five years ago. But what's the problem with having a bit of nostalgia? What's the yeah. problem in going back, having a bit of fun, reliving some, some things? Um, I think it's just, I think it's just cool. I, I, I know for, from a personal standpoint, I used to love landing at Snobby Shores on that yeah. west side of the map. I can't wait to go there again. And just like little bits on the map. I don't even know what it's going to look like yet. Right. Of course, as we're recording, we don't know what the map's going to look like or what the, the vibe is going to be around that season. But um, from what I'm hearing from leaks and stuff on, on Twitter, it, it looks very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think just just getting into that that old map, the old feeling, the old graphics and stuff. It's just yeah. it's kind of something that is quite nice to do for a little bit. Obviously, the game needs to progress, the game yeah. needs to develop, and they've done a really really good job at that. Because if they didn't do that, we wouldn't probably still be talking about Fortnite today. One hundred percent. But it's nice to look back sometimes. I think yeah, you know that was that was a yeah. nice little area. That was a nice nostalgic thing. So they've done a good job in recent seasons of like bringing some POIs back and sort yeah. of like tilted bringing back in some areas and snobby and uh, not snobby and uh, shifty shafts and stuff. Yeah. So. I think, yeah, I, I, it'll be fun. Either way, it'll be fun. It'll be great. And I'm hoping a lot of people come back to it and yep. realize the potential of the game and realize, you know, that it's still a really, really fun game, whether we're on the old map or the new. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that brings more people to, you know, all different communities, both, yeah. both competitive and otherwise. Yeah, that's. I think that's the uh, that, that's going to be my favorite part. I, it's going to take a second to get used to not mantling and sprinting. Yeah, you know, that's, true. yeah. that. But that's going to, I mean, that's the fun part about it. It takes you back and it makes you see how different the game is now. Um, what would you what would what is your opinion on do you feel like Fortnite has this you because you brought it up a lot of people have left and you know ventured off into different games and that may be naturally just growth and maybe they just want to try different things i.e benji mm -hmm. fishy you know things like that but uh do you feel that for the most part Fortnite gets this random stigma of you know like this dead game even though the numbers doesn't say that and things like that what do you feel about those type of conversations and topics I always find it quite funny. I I, th I think yes, the, Fortnite will not be at the same peaks that it had yeah. because but I think people forget how crazy big that and high that peak yeah. was. That it, if it was up here, if it was right at the top, and then it drops by twenty percent, everyone's like, "Up, oh, dead game." It's dropped by twenty yeah. percent. Whereas that that twenty percent less than it was at its peak is like fifty times better than than so many other games. So I think it's it's scaled yes it's it's obviously now um not at the scale that it was back in the day right. it's not going to be a global and uh and phenomenon across the world all on different sort of uh, news networks and stuff and personalities being sprung out of, out of thin air uh it's it's less like that now but i think it's it's in a good place because it's still you know if you look on the, even the twitch viewing numbers which is quite a, a difficult stat to, to measure things by but it's all we really can go by but uh it's still at the top you know mm -hmm. we, we we still see Fortnite there we still see you know when there's live events when there's big tournaments going on like the globals we saw yeah. i think in the in the twitch category alone for globals we had seven hundred and fifty thousand viewers yeah. which yeah. you know just on that one platform is is really insane so you know there's th there's always going to be conversations about this is this is bad this is good this is dead this is not but <laughs> yeah. i think that, that'll happen no matter what so right. it's like it's it, it, it's to be expected i think at this yeah. stage yeah so that that that's uh that's definitely the perspective I take as well. It just comes with the territory, in my opinion. You know, uh, yeah. so to to end this segment off, um, the kids the kids seem so engaged at this global championship. Obviously, like we said, you met somebody in the community, uh, Bijonar. You met him and his son. Yeah. Uh, what did it feel like uh, giving some autographs away? You know, signing that right. signature. <laughs> it was I don't know, it was crazy, right? It was yeah. like the the whole experience of globals to to people coming up to you and asking for pictures. I, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know who you are. They don't know your background mm -hmm. and all that sort of stuff, but they just see the big camera and the big lights being shiny. He was like, oh, that guy is on the screen. I, I want to <laughs> yeah. meet him, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the amount of the amount of autographs, the amount of pictures, um, I felt like, I felt like Beyonce uh, <laughs> somehow, you know. Like I, I'm just, I'm just mini minor. I'm just, a, I'm just a little lad from Wales, you know. I'm not, yeah. I'm nobody crazy, but uh, it was, it was definitely really cool. I think the 
more than just a personal standpoint, it was nice to see people getting involved with mm -hmm. the talent and with us as as personalities on the show. Because at the end of the day, it's our job to be the face of the broadcast. Right. Right. So if we're doing a good job at that, people will start to relate. People mm -hmm. will start to, you know, communicate with us and start to relate to what we're doing and enjoy what we're doing. Yeah. So just to, although it's nice to see comments online and nice to see good feedback, to see that in person, say, oh, I really like what you're doing, you know, having conversations about the game. What's your favorite drop spot? Who do you think is going to win? Those, that definitely helps me realize the scale at which uh the, we we can bring to, to, to yeah. the broadcast and what you know how many people do enjoy watching it because even when we're in the studio in copenhagen it's it's 5 a.m we're finishing the show on na uh on the na broadcast we're all tired but there are people out there that yeah. are genuinely interested and genuinely enjoying the what we do so that for me was really crazy and even after one of the show days we were finished we went back to the hotel and we were a little bit hungry, so we yeah. walked across to a Burger King just across the road from our hotel, which was right next to the arena. Mm. And it was me, it was me, Levin, uh, Frankie, and Vivid, who's yeah. one of the people on the talent yes. team. Yep. And we walked in, and there was obviously a lot of people in there that had just watched the show. Mm -hmm. And there was an audible gasp as soon as we opened the door, <laughs> like, oh my goodness, look who it is. And that, for me, just was one of the craziest moments and something I'll never forget, because like all these people coming up to us, the kids having pictures, the adults yeah. having pictures, uh, signing stuff. I ruined so many hoodies because they <laughs> wanted us to sign it. Um, and it genuinely took me about 30 or 40 minutes to, to, to order yeah. my food, but it was so lovely to get to speak to everyone and get to have that face-to-face -face interaction, uh, even at just a random, random yeah. place and unexpectedly. So yeah, that, that was nice. Um, yeah. It was a cool, cool part of it, but you know, overall, it's just, it's just nice to see people engage. That's all that I, I think about that. For sure, yeah, I think that uh, I'm, I'm avid on collectors having that opportunity to connect with the, the pros, the content creators, the broadcasters, because I think honestly, y'all deserve it. You know what I mean? I think it's the, it's the, it's a top tier game. That, like we talked about, the skill gap, the skill set to take to even get to that level. Um, just like any other pro, whether it's football, whether it's American football, whether it's basketball, uh, NHL, all of these sports, they have they have these fan bases that appreciate what they can do because they can't do it or they just admire it in general. And that doesn't change when it comes to Fortnite. So I do love seeing the opportunities for y'all to do autos and stuff like that because it's it's definitely that major and y'all deserve it for sure. Yeah, I appreciate it. It was, yeah. it was it's just it's just nice, you know. It's yeah. just nice to see uh, people people involved and um, the players, of course, getting to meet their fans and just I think for them it's 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 a big eye opening thing as well. That that when we would like there was a little player walkouts thing as well, so we sort of introduced all the players individually and the players that got the most cheers were the ones with their brands and the ones that had connected yeah. with that community and had connected with a wider audience. So I think for a lot of players that was very eye opening and the fact that wow, people really love Mr. Savage, people really love yeah. clicks. I want to try and get to that level as well. So it's only good for the whole ecosystem that mm -hmm. more people are trying to get to that level. Um, and just to, yeah, just to see the fans yeah. is, is really cool. Yeah. So uh, I have a I have a question for you before we transition to the next part. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So let's do a little hard topic. You don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Uh, <laughs> is it Booga or Tayson that's the GOAT? Or is it Miro? Or is it somebody else? What's your answer? It's difficult. <laughs> The goat. I mean, the, the thing is, there's so much debate around this because yeah. obviously there's there's so many different. The thing is, you you look at Taysen and you think, yes, uh, online, absolutely insane, but doesn't really do much at lands mm -hmm. when it comes down to it. He hasn't really had a big land performance. Uh, Booger, of course, won the World Cup and then continued to to do well uh, and won multiple FNCS titles towards the end of Chapter Two and uh, beginning of Chapter Three. Then, of course, Miro, very, very similar to Booga, but has won a more recent LAN. Mm -hmm. So do you weigh more importance on that? But um, someone that I do want to shout out as well is Cami. Of Cammy, course, Cami's such Cammy, a good oh, player yeah. on yeah. LAN. Um, he, for me, is probably alongside Epic Whale, my LAN goat. But when it comes to overall, I don't. I feel like you have to put Miro in there. But yeah. I think Booga. Booga? You, you, you've still got to say Booga for now. Um, yeah, I think just the way that he was still able to, to be on top and mm -hmm. I uh, obviously, you know, did very, very well at the, the World Cup, won it. Yeah. Um, yeah, Booga, Booga's still my go. I think Miro, Miro is maybe, I think Miro is a second alongside Taysen. Yeah, right? yeah, know, like kind of on Miro. Yeah, yeah, kind of the same. And then, yeah, I, I think Epic Wales up there too, but yeah. it's, it's such a difficult conversation because as you said, we're still so early in the yep. conversation. We still have so much more to give. Yeah, for sure. No, that's, uh, I mean, my bias... My bias is uh is Booga. I just I just loved yeah. that World Cup experience because as you know, Booga had a 
trajectory that was going into the World Cup, but nobody, everybody that they were expecting to win, you know, you got to even think about it. Tifu at that time, Tifu was one yeah. of the, Tifu was projected, you know, to at least compete for, you know, solos, uh, the solo championship, you know, and I, I thought it was interesting seeing, you know, Clicks, like Clicks was that, that sleeper, you know, going in there, he had the popularity and then Booga just, man he just comes out of nowhere and it really wasn't nowhere but he just surged so high in in that competitive i mean his mechanics were so clean and still is clean but yeah his game sense was amazing and you know and uh so i think my bias is booga but i think like you said it's so early that's that can consistently change because you know next year or whenever it happens uh depending on how he performs that conversation might start dwindling or it might come back up you know, I guess we'll have to. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's just like the globals. <laughs> yeah, who would have had Miro in their goat list? <laughs> exactly. Until the globals, exactly. right? So one event can really change so many different people's uh, perspective. And of course, Cooper, shout out to him. He's yes. done it absolutely yeah. insane as well. Five k, five k earned before, and now you know, and now he's in a whole different realm. You know, so, so cool, man. I yeah. love stories like that. Yeah, that was, and just seeing his face when he when they officially knew they won was just like, this this yeah. can't be real, you know, and you yeah. know, but that's amazing. So. Let's go. Obviously, uh, we want to bridge the gap between the actual game and the collecting hobby of Fortnite cards. Mm-hmm. Um, and I know that this may be fairly new to you, but the way a lot of people collect, you know, when it comes to the cards, there's a thing of rarity and scarcity. So there's cards that's naturally hard to pull. So even if they're not technically relevant or a popular skin in game, because they're so hard to pull, they end up becoming popular in the uh, in the actual hobby. But let's go with some that uh, let's talk about some things here. So, what was your what was the first skin that you purchased in the game? First skin, uh, I think. Well, it depends on it depends on how we define it because battle if we're pass. talking uh, battle pass, definitely right, right, does that yeah. count? I don't know, right? I got a free skin. I mean, my first ever skin that wasn't a uh, default was it was a PlayStation uh skin i forgot what it was called blue blue team leader blue team leader um, yeah. blue team leader so a little you know sort of skin yep. with like a little uh, blue hat on and all yep. that it was a playstation plus exclusive yep, thing so you just you know it was free so i was like oh yeah brilliant i'm because realistically back when i first started playing i didn't i didn't think i'd actually play the game for that long mm-hmm. so i was like ah should i buy the battle pass <laughs> this was back in season two of chapter one i was like ah, I, I won't buy the battle pass i probably won't play too much that obviously wasn't <laughs> quite how it ended up. Um, I, I bought the season three battle pass, and that was my first sort of paid for skin. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that whatever that that orange uh, spaceman yep. uh, Jonesy was? But yep. uh, yeah, I, I like that one. I, th- I think that battle pass is really cool as well. Obviously, having the, the Reaper as the tier one hundred. Yep. I remember if ever you saw a Reaper in game, you were <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, that's it, it's over. Right, it's, it's over. time to queue up for the next one. You know, he's going <laughs> to build a, a, the Empire State Building right yep. here. So um, yeah, it's fine. It's, 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 it's nice though to, to to have those. Yeah. Uh, experiences yeah that, i think that's that's interesting the reason why i ask you that is because i think uh when people come into the fortnite card hobby they kind of look for the the memories they had first and even if like you open the packs the first thing you notice is a skin that you connected with earlier early on yeah. and uh that's that's always amazing uh and blue so blue team leader is ironic because she didn't actually make the set she ended up becoming a pro she's ended up being a prototype uh oh wow yeah long story short you know they were supposed to uh discard of it whoever worked at uh the company panini and they didn't and it got out into you know collector's hands so blue squire is a sought after prototype card now so it kind of goes along Ooh. with her rarity as well so yeah that's that's one of the best parts about it honestly now yeah, I, I mean i love the whole i love the whole collecting community i think it's i think it's really cool as you mentioned i'm not really as involved in it as, as some people i don't know too much about it but it's something that i'm loving to learn more about mm-hmm. um after seeing some people that are obviously globals and swing to yourself it's really it's really cool to see because it's like it just shows there's so much depth to the Fortnite community. Yeah. It's not just competitive or casual. It's like all zero build or build. It's mm-hmm. like there's so much more than that. And I, this is the sort of thing that I think brings so many people together. And yeah. it's cool, man. I love it. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I think, I think that's the thing. We're, we're just trying to because unfortunately, what happened is, um, Panini when Fortnite and Epic Games licensed out the cards to Panini, uh, unfortunately, it didn't get any marketing pretty much no marketing at all. So a lot of the gamers that were playing the game, it kind of fell by the wayside. Nobody really knew about them. So 
that's kind of what yeah. happened. So it was one of those things where we're like, all right, we love this hobby. We know people love the game. So any chance we get, we just kind of talk about it with gamers and things like that. So uh, it's great to see that. Even when I was looking back at, you know, uh, I love to see that you wear the, the superhero skin. We talk about the superhero skins all the time you yeah. know, for competitive advantage and just wearing the all white, <laughs> you know, all of those things. Yeah. So yeah. that uh, and the superhero skins made it into series three, which was the third set. Cool. And uh, so people started purchasing those cards because they'll go to land events and it's kind of one of the easiest ones to get auto because mostly everybody wears them especially if they're playing competitive True. so you know you may not have their main skin or the skin that they really connect with but you do have a skin when they're going into competitive uh lobbies and things like that that more than likely they wear so it's all those little nuanced things that we pay attention to on ya and you know at the top tier and even on the uh broadcasting side but we can't we can't go too far without saying you did have your first earnings of what was it a what was it a couple how long ago was that that you got 300 a piece with it your was rules? yeah that was <laughs> um that was actually last season that was last season yeah. it was a third party event it was a 5k zero build cup and we basically employed a really interesting strategy <laughs> with the there was an npc at slaffy shores mm -hmm. and it basically heals you it was like one of the medic npcs and yeah. it just chug smash you every single time you needed it so we just it was a third party event so we could use vehicles and we just yeah hired him got all the gold <laughs> got into the zone with the with the vehicle he just kept chugging us and uh we just spent a lot of time in storm so we got fourth in that in the end which we actually could have won we were, we were first going into yeah. the last game we kind of threw a little bit but uh first earnings there and then that same season hundred dollars from a duo victory cup so i mean come it's, on it's always cool. <laughs> i mean to be to be broadcasting and earning at least you know <laughs> that's you can't you can't beat that it's it's very hard to earn anything in uh in fortnite that is like a major achievement and then to be calling the games as well that's just <laughs> that's that's <dope. laughs> of course so i want to see how uh deep you get into this do you connect any skins with pros like we know the ones but do you would you is there some skins that you connect with pros like so if we think of like a dynamo who do, who does dynamo represent to you dynamo for me represents mongrel <laughs> uh i think i think that's always like the mongrel skin um yeah i'd say that or maybe mitro i think he wore mm -hmm. it quite a bit mm -hmm. uh but obviously they were very involved together so they were often just wearing it because each other wore it yeah, yeah. I, th I think i definitely do i think less so now mm -hmm. i don't know why I, I think it becomes i don't think many people have like um iconic skins because there's just so many that people yeah. kind of switch and yep. mix and match all the time so i feel like there is less of that um nowadays but yeah og people of course you yeah. know like fish state we all know yep. Benji Benji Fishy. Fishy. yep it's, uh, it's 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 nice to have those sort of uh, yeah. affiliations yeah that's that's always the that's always the fun part seeing not uh, what those connect to even like a cypher pk with manic and uh yeah, even great. a connection with elite agent and stuff like that uh clicks with spark plug all of those you know you yep. you booga with uh with crystal that's you know that's like yeah. one of those one of those connections you just automatically make it's pretty much soon as he after he won the world cup you know he kind of started rotating in the crystal and then it just became you know booga skin you know he was at the top yeah. of the world so those are that's always amazing moments uh would you so we have these conversations all the time because there's um like we said it's natural rarity and scarcity when it comes to the cards but there are skins that represent Fortnite as in like iconic skins skins you just don't forget about you know skins that you always come to your head when you mention Fortnite what are those yeah. skins for you let's name like four to five skins that represent <laughs> Fortnite for you um i think for me jonesy has to be one yeah. of them you know just one of whether these had so many different styles so mm -hmm. any any style of jonesy whether it be the default one or not um probably probably the default one is, is what everyone thinks mm -hmm. about right so uh yeah for me what other ones would i say for me par patroller i've always mm -hmm. liked par patroller mm -hmm. she's always a cool outfit i i've worn her for a, a long a long time before i uh before I started wearing the, like the superhero skins and stuff for the, for the mm -hmm. competitive thing, but uh, that was all like my main skins. So, yeah, uh, that 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 one I have to mention. Um, I do like the. I'm trying to think about what they're called, but it's the, is it the Mogul Master? Yeah, the Mogul Master E ones. Yep. Yeah, like seeing like Nick A30 wear the yeah. uh, wear the Canadian one, and you know that for me is a really cool thing because I get to see you get to see sort of which countries people are representing. Mm -hmm. um, they sort of have little clans. We talked about them earlier. Soccer skins yep. have to give those a mention. Um, 
And I think for, for me, the last one is probably either the Black Knight, although I'm not lucky enough to have the Black Knight, or the Renegade Raider, you know, yeah. one of those OG sort yeah. of very rare skins yeah. that I don't have. And I'm very jealous of anyone that does have them <laughs> Same. because they're so Same. cool and I wish I had them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, any any of those sort of OG ones are yeah. really nice. Yeah, like that's, that's kind of the story that's written all the time. I started off in season three, chapter one, season three, but like you, uh, I was hesitant. I was like, I'm not buying anything in the game. I'm going to just keep wearing the defaults. <laughs> and then by the time season four came out, I was like, okay, I have to get this battle pass. So I, yep. I would regret it because like you said, the Reaper skin, he was kicking my butt every game that I played. <laughs> like, it, just, it was ironically yep. Reaper and, Rene, uh, and Rabbit Raider, the pink. I don't know what it was, but for some reason in them early seasons, that pink bunny used to kill me all the time. I remember I, that. Yeah. yeah that. <laughs> it was like, I don't know what it was, but that was just yeah. one of those situations. And then so, uh, and for Dylan, he started just like you, he started, I believe in chapter uh, one, season two, and he nice. didn't buy the battle pass till, uh, no, matter of fact, he bought that one. He just didn't make it to Black Knight. So that oh, was, no. yeah, yeah. That hurts. That yeah. stings. That so, stings. So he didn't make it to Black Knight. And that's, that was one of those feelings. And I think that's what happens in a hobby as well. So you either don't buy the card or don't have no, have no interest in the card because you never got it in game or you have to have the card because you don't have it in game. So and that's <laughs> kind of like makes up exactly, for it a little bit. Yeah. Exactly. So it's kind of that, that mix, but, uh, that's that's amazing and it's just it's so natural you know you you have all these skins in your locker and you know you've been accumulating them over time and then it's just like this transition to like a physical item and it's kind of like yeah. it's like an oxymoron because fortnite is so digital and it's like this first digital game that yep. that took off the way it did and to this scale and but now you have like these physical cards so that's that's always amazing but um i want to mix this up too i want to give you some insight uh, some more insight on this aspect, but I want to spin it back to you. Um, when it comes to the Fortnite cards, what it is is so there's USA print, there's Italy print, and there's Brazil print. It, okay. USA came out first, and it was Italy, and then Brazil came out. And so there's this whole debate on the rarity and scarcity of these sets. So you kind of have these Italy collectors, Brazil, and then you have these USA collectors. We kind of touched on it before, but um. Let's mix this up. That's for the cards. But what do you think is the best region? Who has the best regional players? Is it EU? Is it NA? What do you What do you feel? And obviously, there's more regions than that. But what I will let you give your yeah. opinion. What do you feel? Definitely EU uh, for me. I think <laughs> yeah. we've you know for uh, maybe it's biased because I'm from the yeah, UK, so no, we're in yeah. the EU region, right? But uh, I I think definitely uh, EU produces the most talent. Produced uh, the I think the largest percentage of the qualified players mm -hmm. into the grand finals of global championships. Mm -hmm. I think it was 23 out of 26 or 23 out of 25, something like that. Um, so that was really good. But I was really impressed with NA at the Globals. Yeah. Uh, they did really good. Yeah. They did really good. And I remember talking to some of the other talent who are very NA-based, sort of Vivid and, and Kelly and yeah, uh, people like that. And I was like, you guys didn't tell me how good these <laughs> NA guys were going to be at this Global State. I thought yeah. you were going to absolutely run the show and dominate. But uh, of course, you know, an NA duo winning it. And then we even had an Asia duo coming yep. fifth, which is yep. like what we saw at the Invitational. We had a Brazil duo mm -hmm. coming fifth in uh, Fiesta and Quito. So it's like, anything can happen yeah. um in fortnite so it's like it's very hard to pin down a, a region as mm -hmm. this is definitively the best but um yeah you i think we, we just have no, yeah, a lot of pretty good i, players, I respect you know? that me and uh <laughs> me and one of our friends we talk about it all the time uh and it's it's so easy to be unbiased though because yeah the competition is so high and like you said it just changes so much and then you end up falling in love with the storyline it's like and so it just ends up being just it's just a mix of so many teams that you enjoy. Uh, and I really, I really enjoyed seeing Cami and Seti the way they uh, transitioned even after, because I'm being, being that top tier, you know, last year, and then you have to come back and do it all over again, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, you know, yeah. and uh, what Vin, Vino was feeling and it's just, oh, I just loved his, I love that he wears his emotions on his sleeve. You know, I love that. <laughs> I, love, I love it. Uh, yeah. so it's just, it's just so many storylines and I just love talking about the regions and it's just kind of funny that the car is tied into that as well. So I had to ask you that because I figured you would say EU <laughs> because technically as of right now, it's, it's technically true. It is. I mean, if we look at if yeah. you look at all the statistics and everything, it's it's technically true. So uh, we'll see if NA can uh, close that gap as you know time goes on. 
I mean, I think NA have a good, they have a good argument yeah. to, to say that they're yeah. on top right now, of course, winning globals. So yeah. uh, I think they did, yeah, I mean, NA put on a great performance. And I think even the great thing about these sort of global competitions is we saw uh, an EU player in Kirby yeah. tearing, pairing up with uh, Wixie, who yes. is from yeah. Asia. So it's yeah. like we have these sort of Frankenstein duos that are coming together, which mm -hmm. is always nice. And you get to see how much of an importance communication and, mm -hmm. and team chemistry and practice and stuff goes into it because we didn't obviously yeah. see them qualify through. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, that's what's so good about the global stage. Mm -hmm. That's what's so good about even collecting in general yeah. is that it doesn't just bring, it's not just focused on one community or one region. It's everyone comes yes. together for the same love of the same thing, whether it be the game competitively mm -hmm. or collecting or, or casually. Yeah, that that's amazing. That's amazing because that's exactly how we feel. Um, yeah. What so I did see I, this one. So you uh you hosted a high school uh competition, right? Was that was it a high school competition? Like how does that that is trickled into actual schools and stuff? I think that's amazing. I even seen that there's some scholarships for Fortnite to play Fortnite. Yep. Um, what do you think the projection for that is? Is that something that you see consistently growing and being adapted and accepted? Yeah, I think it's really important as well. I think it's it's an important aspect of of esports in general, uh, not just Fortnite, mm -hmm. but for me specifically, it helped me develop into a, a, an esports talent, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the as I mentioned, I did that show for TNA. We did that initial sort of big opportunity that I got, and then the the following opportunities I got from that was in the the collegiate mm -hmm. space, was in the high school space. So uh, were very you know there were smaller level broadcasts, but of course that helped myself develop into mm -hmm. talent and other people. Even Jacob PR, my first external show <laughs> was with Jacob PR. Now he's also on the big stage yep. doing what we do. Um, and even from a player perspective, it's great to see them develop thing as well and getting supported whilst playing games because they are so good and they deserve that support to develop into a fantastic top tier esports player uh in, in in fortnite competitive so although fortnite is a very e open ecosystem in general it's nice to see those very solidified collegiate high school and uh just general sort of scholarship based schemes being mm -hmm. put into place because it gives a nice clear path right so you're also in school which is very important you know get yep. that education get that safety net but also you're given the freedom mm -hmm. you're given the flexibility to to pursue what you love and of course you know if you're good enough you can make it to the very top and there were some there's some players that uh, that were there that i remember casting all the way back <laughs> wow. in 2021 wow. when i first started that were at globals <laughs> uh competing in the in the collegiate space which i think is really cool that just shows yeah. the really lovely path for him yeah that's that's amazing i I think that's um you know at the time my brother was of the high school age so i can imagine if that was the case when he first started yeah. playing and that's so i think i think that's amazing i think that's great for the future of fortnite competitive and uh in general now do you uh do you follow the storyline at all or are you enamored into the competitive side how how are you with that i think i i was definitely i was definitely more following the storyline um I, I think I found it difficult to follow the storyline since sort of maybe chapter three. Mm -hmm. I was very much involved in the storyline. I was very, very excited. I was always refreshing Donald Musk's yeah. Twitter to see if he was going to change his location and whatnot. Uh, for me, it's I, I feel like it's so, there's so much going on. There's so much storyline that I haven't really delved deep into it. Mm -hmm. But whenever there's a live event or there's some big thing that's going on, yeah. I try and catch up with like, right, okay, so Jonesy's doing that. That's the foundation. <laughs> yep. That's the zero point, right? What does that do with that? And it's trying to like piece everything together mm -hmm. to actually make sense of what I'm about to see. So I think it is really difficult to follow, but yeah. um, it, once you do, I think it's a very rewarding part of Fortnite. And not, yeah. not a lot of people give enough credit because they do a really good job at keeping the game interesting, whether it's mm -hmm. just for gameplay, but also the, the sort of lore around it as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's we we love the storyline, and uh, like you said, though, it has been in a very intricate place over the past couple, at least over a year. So uh, yeah. hopefully soon that it kind of gets more cohesive and comes together a little bit more way that, that the collectors can can bring that in as well because you see you know you have outfits even for me personally like you have outfits that you remember from a particular event from a particular um competitive event or a particular game that really is memorable for you bringing that into the irl world with a little card or yep. something that you know maybe maybe something bigger is i, I think it's really cool and you know we we're talking about the, the outfits earlier yeah. I, I remember i qualified for dreamhack semi-finals with the with the focus skin uh -huh. it, was a, it was a crazy crazy qual we never expected a qual <laughs> i played with someone that i hadn't really played with before uh, yeah. in competitive events one of my one of my uh, good friends Yuji, who also was a streamer back then um nobody expected us to qualify but we did it and we yeah. did it with that skin on and whenever i see that skin i'm like that is the skin that made me qual so 
people remember skins people remember collector's items mm -hmm. for that moment yeah. and it's nice to have it's nice to have it in game it's nice to show people oh yeah look at that that's what i won but to yeah. have it on your mantelpiece and see like yeah this is what i this yeah. is what i did this brings <laughs> me back to that moment that's what it's all about no yeah you made uh dylan very happy with this one because he champions that skin focus like that's nice. that's his skin that's the skin that he was very convinced is gonna be you know very popular throughout and it, it is i mean you yeah. can't go in too many competitive games without seeing focus so that's that's great that's one of those things like you said you just remember those moments it's hard to forget yep. it's like you're you're immersed in the moment so you just those things you just don't forget the skin it's just it's just there yeah. it's just there for sure because you're bro broadcasting you see all these skins you see all these players consistently what are the sweatiest skins in fortnite give me five <laughs> sweatiest skins um I would say the sweatiest skins right now. Now I don't know the name for them. You yeah, probably yeah. will. You probably will know the name. But it's uh, they came out quite recently. They're customizable. You could sort of um, they're like bandit type yep, skins they, where they you have, put the uh, hat on and you have the hat on. Yep. You can have like a like a balaclava. You yep. can put loads of emojis on there or stickers or whatever uh, they're called. But whenever I see one of those in game, they're so good. I don't know how. I think it just increases your skill level 10x. <laughs> I didn't even get them in the end. Yeah. Um, but one of those skins, I, I some somebody will know the name out there somebody yep. will, will, yep. will make sure that they know um but those skins obviously the superheroes everyone yep. goes straight to them uh and it's quite cool to see the sort of development of it because i wouldn't even say the soccer skins are necessarily that right. sweating anymore exactly um they kind of know, took place of those <laughs> they kind of did yeah. exactly that that because they were so much customizable yep. you could you could do that um in terms of other ones that i'm trying to think of here let's see so i i think whenever you see an aura in game they're pretty they're pretty good you know yep. they know what they're doing um I think even even the OG skins, I, I think it's kind of a mixed bag. If, if you see a Renegade Raider, they've mm -hmm. either just loaded up the game <laughs> after three years of not playing yep, yep. or they're keeping on playing it since since the very old old days so maybe an og skin but i'm kind of reluctant to say that yeah uh what other ones would be would, would i say uh, maybe an echo echo, echo skin is yeah. always good echo yep. is always good and yep. i do like that as a personal favorite yeah um so yeah they, they'd probably be my my main sweat skins if i, I like was that. against that's them. that's pretty on par to me that's pretty on par that's, uh, <laughs> Yeah, man, I I appreciate you coming on. I I I'm a big fan of your broadcasting. is It's amazing to see where the game has gone and how we are influencing the competitive side. Uh, you know, it's just man, good luck to all your endeavors. Hopefully, we get some news. I think last year we'll see. I think last year we got news of the global championship in January. I believe it was something yeah, along that yeah. lines. So hopefully, we'll get some news then. Um, I'm pretty sure it will happen. Uh. Yeah, man, I'm excited for everything that's coming with Fortnite. We're going back to an OG season. We know you have the Fortnite mirrors right now. All of these things are just happening consistently. Um, anything you want to lead off with? You want to give your social media? Anything you want to say? Yeah, of course. I mean, thank you so much for having me on. Yeah. It's great to see what you're doing. And uh, likewise, you know, keep up the great work yourself. I think it's it's important that that different communities come together because, of course, you know, maybe I'm not so involved in the collecting community. I definitely am more now after yeah. speaking to you and getting to getting to experience what it what, what it's like and the, the, what it means to people. But I think it's important that we we don't separate communities into, oh, he's yeah. a competitive player. I don't like him. He's a casual. I don't like him, whatever. It's like it's nice to see people come together. It's nice to see communities yeah. have that because we all share the same love for the same game. Yeah game the same ip of Fortnite. we love it so you know it's been an absolute pleasure to to, to talk to you and uh, to to get to have a little a little chat about comp because yes. it's always it's always a uh, it's always yeah. nice you know that's she it's that's what i get paid for it's what we all love to <laughs> yep. love to do so talk about competitive so uh, yeah again thank you for having me on yes. and you can find me on socials just type in mini minor uh, or just mini minor yt on, on twitter and instagram and you'll you'll find me so uh, feel free to message me or reach out because i'm always happy to Perfect. answer any questions